Hello, everyone. Welcome to an episode of Your Honor. Um, I'm your host today, Carl Mugazi, and I'm joined on the panel by Paige. Hey, everybody. And TJ. Hey, everyone. Awesome. And our guest today is Dillian Magida. Hi, Dillian. Yeah, hi. Cool. Let's start off by maybe you telling us a bit about yourself, um, why you're famous, um, what you do in development, and uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm not sure I'm famous. <laughs> well, you are um, now. <laughs> okay, my name is Dillion and I'm from Nigeria, a software engineer and a technical writer. Currently work at this dot and I write on a lot of publications, a lot of organizations. I write with Free Code Camp, I write with Log Rocket and a few other places and I think that's the basic about me. Cool, cool. When I went freelance, I was still only a few years into my development career. My first contract, I was paid 60 bucks an hour. Due to feedback from my friends, I raised it to 120 bucks an hour on the next contract. And due to the podcasts I was involved in and the screencasts I had made in the past, I started getting calls from people I'd never even heard of who wanted me to do development work for them because I had done that kind of work or talked about or demonstrated that kind of work in the videos and podcasts that I was making. Within a year, I was able to more than double my freelancing rates, and I had more work than I could handle. If you're thinking about freelancing or have a profitable but not busy or fulfilling freelance practice, let me show you how to do it in my Dev Heroes Accelerator. Dev Heroes aren't just people who devs admire. They're also people who deliver for clients who know, like, and trust them. Let me help you double your income and fill your slowdowns. You can learn more at devheroesaccelerator.com. So um, in terms of your writing, is there any kind of particular things or topics you like writing about or enjoy most of all? Well, as a software engineer, I write about or I, I love writing about everything I learn. But mostly I write about web development because that's my specialty. And I also have a major focus on the front end. So you'll find a lot of articles around front end technologies, frameworks, practices and around, frame, around front end generally. Cool, cool. So one of the articles you wrote about recently was about building a source plugin with Gatsby. And maybe we, could talk, we could maybe look at that a bit. So in terms of Gatsby itself, for people that maybe don't know about Gatsby, can you maybe talk about Gatsby itself as a platform and what, and what you can do with it? Okay, Gatsby is a React framework. It's built based on React. And the beauty of Gatsby that I know is that it's a static generator tool. It's used for building or used for generating static sites. So you have your you have your JavaScript, you have every of your assets, and then they're just compiled together to create those static sites. And then another beautiful thing about Gatsby again is it's it uses GraphQL, which means within your pages you can query nodes that are created inside of your application or from other plugins. So you can query those nodes and then build your application based on those nodes. So I'm pretty familiar with Gatsby. I actually built my own personal website with it. And one thing that I've noticed about it is that it really, it takes advantage of the plugin ecosystem that has kind of sprung up around it. It seems like whatever you might need in terms of links or Google fonts or analytics or whatever, there's probably a Gatsby plugin for it, but I've never certainly never really looked under the hood of the plugins to see how they're built. So I'd love to hear how you, you know, how you got started or what you needed that there wasn't a plugin for, and then how you went about building one and adding it into the ecosystem. Okay. Yeah. I forgot to mention that Gatsby has a very large plugin ecosystem, almost if not every, everything you need links, images, um, the team, the team at Gatsby, they are also creators of some of these plugins and they optimize the site in various ways. So for me, before, well, I had been using plugins right from when I started, because even when you are starting, you're already starting based on one or two of the most important plugins that are necessary for building your site. One of which is the Gatsby Transformer tool. There are a few very important ones when starting up. So when I started, I started installing plugins and I got almost everything I need. Like if I needed something, all I just have to do is go online, search for Gatsby, this, and then there is a plugin for it. So my first attempt at creating a plugin was I didn't really need to do something. I just wanted to explore 
plugins. I just wanted to create a plugin of my own. And the first one I created was for, I don't know if you're familiar with Dev2, blogging platform for majorly web or majorly software engineers. So yeah. on Dev2, when writing articles, using the markdown, you can, there's something they call liquid tags. So liquid tags are a beautiful way to embed services on your on your blog. So you can embed tweets, you can embed code pens. And instead of, you know, going on to code pen and then copying the embedded code, you just use this liquid tag, starts with a curly brace, ends with a curly brace, then the code pen, and then maybe the, the link of the code pen. And then in the build blog, it has um, the embedment of that code pen. So when I saw that, I was building my Gatsby application, my own personal blog, and I wanted to embed all of these services too. So instead of going online to copy the embed code, I thought about creating my own liquid tags, but for Gatsby applications. So it was while doing that, I discovered how how interesting or how fascinating it was when building your own plugins. So yeah, that was my first experience with creating my own plugin. Cool. I mean, I first um, came across Gatsby, I think it's a couple of years ago, when I was doing that typical thing of a developer trying to do a new blog, and you get more excited about the process, right, of doing the development and creating the blog. And one of the things I struggled with back then was understanding how it all works, and maybe um, it's probably changed now, I'm guessing, in terms of new material and new tutorials. But in terms of getting started, how easy... Is, is it now, would you say, in terms of for somebody who wants to build a blog, right, and, and Paige has, has done it as well already, but how easy do you think it is now in terms of just getting a blog up there and, um, and, and getting started with content and everything else? Well, with a lot of plugins created and a lot of templates created, of course, by the community, it's very easy. In fact, if you do not have a design of your own, you can just go to the Gatsby site and you can just duplicate a template, have it in your own name, and then you have your blog ready. So it's very, very easy. And a lot of templates are still uh, they are still being created for blogs, for e-commerce websites, for a lot of other use cases. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that that is the case. On the Gatsby website, they even have a thing that they call starters, which is hundreds of Gatsby starter websites that people have built and they're for everything. There's ones that work for blogs. There's ones that are set up for e-commerce. There's ones that are, the one that I used was called an advanced starter and it has a whole bunch of stuff built into it or already kind of, I guess, set up plugins for SEO and plugins for sharing and plugins for discuss. If you want to have comments But what I really liked about that one in particular was even though it had all of this kind of configuration set up, it had no styles. So you were able to then completely take control of how you wanted it to look. And really, I I added a bunch of stuff. I removed a bunch of plugins that I didn't care about. So there's, there's something for everybody, regardless of what you're looking for. There's ones that are set up to run on AWS. There's ones that have authentication. There's ones that integrate with different CMS systems already. There's, if you, if you can tell like what you're looking for, or if there's some, you know, buzzwords that you're trying to hit, you can probably find it as a category under these starters. So it's really, really helpful in that regard. Yeah. The, the Gatsby site is pretty cool. Although I know that next is like really gunning for them in addition to its server-side rendering and its ability to be flexible enough to be a full application as well. So it'll be interesting to see how they continue to compete with each other and improve because of it. I'm, I'm curious too. So the blog post you wrote is about a source plugin. So is source there referring to the content itself that's going to drive like a blogger? I'm curious what source is in this context. Okay, source contest of source plugin is I'll call it a feature or a technique. It's just a technique for pulling content from various sources. So you can either pull locally or pull externally from another website, from an API. That's just what source means there. Gotcha. So it would be like, I want to use Gatsby to build my site, but the content itself is in 
wherever, right? Some other platform, some other API. Okay. So I'm guessing this is all kind of part of the um, Jamstack, right? The new hotness, yeah. <laughs> if you like. Um, <laughs> front end, um, front end, um, thing. So with regard to the whole kind of ecosystem, um, I know that Paige mentioned um, next. Um, what is it? What are the options out there, and why does Gatsby for you stand out compared to Next.js or other things that should be used for for this kind of thing? Oh well, when you look at Next.js, in my own experience, Next.js is more performant, or specifically for server server side rendering. Of course, it does static side generation, but when you look at Gatsby and Next year, in my experience, if you want static um, static assets at the end of the day, Gatsby has a lot of support for that. I mean, that is even their their main their main product. But when you're looking at server side rendering, then you can go to Next Year's. So of course, you hear a lot of arguments about Next Year's doing all that Gatsby does, but in Gatsby defense, I would say Gatsby has a lot of things that makes them exceptional once it comes to static side generator. One of which is this source plugin. And then another is the plug plugin ecosystem. You see a lot of plugins. So if you're doing static sites, uh, in my opinion, next year doesn't come as close as Gatsby. But once you're doing anything server side, then next year sticks to win. Cool, yeah. I'm I'm looking at the Gatsby library right now and on the website it says you've got more than twenty five hundred plugins for actually building your your different websites. So clearly um a lot of work has gone into the community to to, yeah. to do so. So if 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 somebody wanted to learn how to create the first plugin, um what tips would you give them based on your own experience and what you've gone through so far? Well, creating a plugin first it depends on what you want to do. There are transformer plugins. Transformer plugin, as the name, as name means, is just you are transforming an asset, you are transforming data, you are transforming an image. There are also source plugins, and those are the two common ones. I don't know if there are any other category. So, and the Gatsby site has documentation on this. You can try some advanced stuff too, but that would heavily depend on how you understand. It the way these plugins work. So if you're creating a source plugin, there is a, there is, there are just basic information you need and then the rest is up to you. There are optional tools you can use. There are optional uh, methods that the Gatsby tool exposes if you're interested in them. But then at the very basic level, the documentation provides enough information that you need in creating any plugin except you're trying to do something that uh, they weren't prepared for. <laughs> so Dillian, I'm looking at your your personal website now. Did you build this with Gatsby? Yes, that was my very <laughs> first experience with Gatsby. Nice. <laughs> Would have been disappointed if it had been anything else, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I see on your About Me page that you're actually the founder of a thing called The Web for Five. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? The Web for Five was a platform I created specifically for writing my own articles. And the reason I created that was DillianMegida.com, my personal website, wasn't exactly a blog. Like it, um, It's my own personal space for writing stuff. So I can write about personal um, life stories and I can also write about articles. So I needed this other space where it would be strictly web development articles, no personal story. And then also um, I was hoping that I would get authors, um, guest um, guest authors that would join me on that platform. And the reason why it's named Web for Five is I wanted to really demystify web topics there. Although people commonly misunderstand me, they, they think that it's meant for five-year-olds, but it's yeah. that's not possible. But the main idea was just demystifying it to the smallest level that anybody could understand. That's very cool. So kind of like I'm five on Reddit. Yeah, that's it. Nice. I, I like this actually quite a bit because you're you're covering, I'm just looking for, so we put the the link to it in the show notes, but things like document fragment in the DOM, 
parameters and arguments, uh, substring and slice methods of strings. And like, these are topics that I think are super valuable and you don't see covered very often, yeah. right? Like this isn't a super hip or trendy thing to cover, but it's actually super useful. So I, this is kind of a, I'm sort of fascinated by the site. I yeah. keep looking through that it. Was, that was the goal. My goal was to touch all those small topics that you you really don't see often. And sometimes they exist, but you're not just aware that there is something like this. You're just creating websites. Yeah, the file input field in depth. I'll, I think I need to bookmark this one. <laughs> <laughs> these are like the, I, I swear, like that's one of the great and horrible things about the web is like there's all these little like nooks and crannies for things that have been around for a while. And some of them are just completely shrouded in in mystery that we just try to ignore. But Sometimes you need to know some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely second that because we, I think it's, it's a thing where once you've been in um, coding for a while, we forget that sometimes the, the, the kind of basic elements are not always that well covered or maybe you might have used it in a project briefly, but don't fully understand how it can be used elsewhere and the power of a particular feature set or whatever. So, I mean... In terms of your writing, um, Dylan, how do you decide what to write and what's your process? Do you um, do an outline first and then maybe work on it for a few weeks? Do you have like a calendar that you have your articles you're, you're writing about? And how do you kind of go about the process of your, of your writing for various blogs and websites? I have one. I have my personal Trello board where I drop my article ideas. So these article inspirations, they come sometimes when I find, when I experience a bug and then I go on Google and then maybe it takes me a lot of time in finding the solution. So when I finally get the solution, I write about it so that anyone using, anyone who experiences the same now has an article that clearly covers that bug. Then some other inspirations, when I discover some tools I never knew existed or some APIs, maybe dumb APIs I never knew existed. Once I come about them, I try to just, uh, I just try to let the public know that such tool exists and this is how to use them. And a very good example was the web share API. I never knew there was a web share API. Whenever I wanted to add sharing features to my applications, I'll have to go to Twitter and copy the, uh, the template URL and go to LinkedIn. But then when I discovered the web share API, the navigator, how it connects with your mobile applications and giving you access to share on WhatsApp, on Facebook, I wrote about it. And I think till now, I think that's my highest viewed article because when I shared it on Twitter, people were like, wow, so this existed. So sometimes when I discover amazing tools like that, I write about them. And then sometimes I write about articles that I want to learn. I want to know how they work. So maybe in my workplace or maybe I'm just going around the internet and I see, for example, the fragments. When I saw the document fragments, I really didn't know how they worked. So I had it on my board that I was going to write about it. And then that caused me to make a lot of research. And then I finally wrote about it. That's very cool. I'm still clicking around on your website. You have you have written for a bunch of, of publications, like you said, LogRocket, Dev.to, Vonage. So I'm curious, how did you get in, in with those publications or Free Code Camp? Did you submit articles to them? Did they come to you? Was it like, how, did, how does that go for anybody who would be interested in potentially writing for things like this in the future? Well, sometimes I've had one occasion where they came to me, but for most others, I'm the one applying. And the reason why I love writing in various places is I don't just want to have my contents in one place. I I believe Free Code Camp has their own audience. Um, Log Rocket has their own audience. So in an attempt to reach out to everyone's audience, then I try to spread my content around. But for anyone trying to apply, some of them, they have their right for us page. Frico Camp has theirs. Log Rocket has theirs. So she's and a few other places I have, they have theirs. And sometimes when your article, wants someone to cover your article somewhere, they reach out. And they're like, okay, I saw your article here and I would love you to write for us. And this is uh, what we have if you're interested. 
Awesome. And um, in terms of your articles so far, are there any ones that are kind of highlights to you besides the web sharing API that you've done for Log Rocket, Trophy Code Camp? And how has that kind of benefited maybe your, your career and led to you um, maybe have more exposure and learning even more than you know already? My favorite article at this point, the one at the top of my head is uh, the, one, the first article I wrote for Log Rocket, and it was understanding queues in Node.js. And the inspiration behind the article was I learned about cues from a tutorial I was watching. And then when I went online to find out more information, I discovered that at that point, I couldn't find any article, even up to the second search result of Google. I couldn't find any article that was specifically for Node.js queues, apart from the one in the Node documentation. So I wrote about it. And when I wrote about it, I realized that people didn't even knew that people didn't even know that there were queues like this in Node.js, and even up to now, I still get feedbacks from friends, and they're like, "Okay, I went on Google or searching for Node.js queues, and your article came out first. So for me, it gave me a lot of understanding. It made me understand a lot of how Node.js works, how it handles asynchronous operations, from reading files to making API requests. It made me understand more like the in-depth of Node.js. And also, I believe with that article, it has made a lot of people online know how Node.js works under the hood. Okay, so I'm totally guilty. I do not know what Node.js <laughs> queues are. And now I'm very curious. Um, so could you explain what like Node.js queues are and like why the, your average developer, like what, like what knowledge of that could help you do? Well, looking at it from the top level, they may really not help you. Because when you go to Node.js, you just call your API, you just read your files, you just perform every of these asynchronous operations, and you really don't care how Node.js handles them. All you're concerned about is Node.js eventually handles them. But the article is yep. relevant when you really want to know how Node.js works. And maybe in some cases where you're trying to understand why this operation was completed before this other operation, then the article will be of good help because the relevance of queues is Node.js expects you to do a lot of asynchronousity. And the queues is just the its own way of ensuring that there are no conflicts. It's its own way of ensuring, it's just like a law or a policy that guides how asynchronous operations are handled within Node.js. So you really may not need it for development, but maybe for interviews or maybe just understanding how Node.js work, the article will be very relevant. Hey folks, if you love this podcast and would like to support the show, or if you wish you could listen without the sponsorship messages, then you're in luck. We're setting up new premium podcast feeds where you can get all of the episodes released after Christmas 2020 without the ads. Signing up will help us pay for editing and production, and you can go sign up at devchat.tv slash premium. Yeah, I can see that because I've definitely written, like usually when I touch Node stuff, it's like quick one-off scripts to yeah. do something. And so there's definitely been times where it's like, I do not know what's happening here, but like as long as my script finishes and does exactly. what it needs to do, it's like great, right? But I could totally see how once like you're writing things that need to stick around and be like production ready, like yeah, I can see why you might need to know that rather than just hoping yeah. for the best. <laughs> so I'm curious, actually, um, you, you mentioned that you you blog about things that just come up that you run across. I'm curious what your day job is because you seem to run across some absolutely fascinating set of topics because I've, I've found it very interesting just seeing the the things you've come up with. So I'm curious, like what your day job is, what sort of things you work on because this is pretty interesting stuff. Okay, well, before I uh, before I got um, working at my current company, I I was a freelancer and I didn't really have many clients. So it's just past now project. But so then I didn't really have much doing. I could just get an idea and in a week I would make my research and I would write. Uh, then when I got my job, my articles, I started writing articles during weekends. So I didn't really have much time during the week. Or if I had any time, I would just, you know, write them pieces by pieces by pieces till the final 
to the final version, but mostly I shift them to weekends. So I could just wake up on Saturday and then go to my board and see something I could pick up. And between Saturday and Sunday, I'll have them written and then I share them during the week. Cool. Looking on your profile also, um, you're building something called, is it Schoolmart? Yeah, it's my own small startup. <laughs> Cool, cool. Yeah, so um, it says it's an online market for business management in Nigerian schools. Maybe you can maybe tell us a bit more about that and how you went about building it and what it's about as well. Okay, so in Nigeria, you have a lot of uh, online markets, online stores. But I discovered, I and my partner, we discovered that for all of these stores, there's really, okay, the main inspiration was right from our university before we finished, we discovered that when people want to go about advertising their products, they share with friends, they share on their WhatsApp status. There really was no formal way of advertising their products around the school. And of course, when I'm sharing my product on my WhatsApp status, it's only my mutual contacts get to see those products. For non-mutual contacts, they would never know unless my friends help me share um, that status. So me and my partner, we we found the need to create an online store, even though it had the same services, same features like every of these online stores, we wanted to create our own online store that would be specifically for schools. So say you're in a school and you have a small business that you are making a life off with, then you can just go to that space and then have your products there. And then the beauty about Schoolmart too is uh, we are still working on, we are still hoping for for the platform to get very recognized such that once you step into any school and you want to buy something online, you don't have to ask questions. You just go to Schoolmat. So it's an online store having most of the features you find online in other stores, but specifically for schools. Cool. That's, and what homepage, sorry. <laughs> well, that's very cool. And of course, my first question is what, what tech stack are you using for it? <laughs> Okay, I'm using um, Next.js on the front end. Ooh. <laughs> and I'm using uh, Next.js and TypeScript on the front end, and I'm using Node.js and Mongo or Mongoose for the back end. Cool, so you've got both Gatsby and Next experience in under your belt. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> so how has it been so far? Is it is it live so that people can start trying it out? Yeah, it's actually live. We are at the stage of promoting and marketing because we we haven't really gotten the recognition that we're looking for, but we are we don't expect an instant recognition. So we are going gradually depending on the resources that we have. That's awesome. Very cool. And and, and I'm guessing in terms of the front end aspect of it, um, how do you go about planning and uh, and the architecture, the kind of comp- the component design, and are uh, using Redux, Mobex for managing the state, um, or like how does that all come together? Okay, so the architecture was very influenced by how. Uh, in my current company, we worked on a project where we use Next.js extensively. And before working on that project, the site was just built with React. So, of course, I had some SEO problems where my pages weren't properly indexed. So when I saw how Next.js was used immediately after the project, so I just took all of that experience, the architecture, the way the, the files were arranged, I just took all of that experience to revamping the whole site. So yeah, so that was it. For state management, I don't have much state management going on, just states within components. I don't have global state management. I haven't found the need yet for that. Maybe I'm not doing things the right way, but I haven't found the need yet for that. I I use the SSR as I need, and then I do the front-end navigations and state management as I also need. I don't think that there is anything wrong with not having pulled in Redux or another state management tool. We had Mark Erickson on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he's one of the creators and or one of the maintainers of Redux now. And one of the things that we talked pretty extensively with him about was the fact that people are jazzed to pull Redux in at the earliest possible 
time that they see they might need it. And usually it's way too soon in the project. And a lot of times it's very unnecessary and uh, something like context would suit their needs just fine. Yeah. So I think you're doing the right thing by not well, over-engineering this early on. Actually, at the point I want to have Redux in, but the way Next.js is built or the way you build Next.js apps, sometimes it's very hard, well, in my experience, it's very hard having shared stuff, like shared functions, especially when you're doing server rendering stuff, because every page, when you're doing server rendering, every page has its own server rendering feature where you can pull from the server or have things statically. So if you're trying to have a maybe a higher order component or uh, something shared with Next.js, sometimes it comes up very difficult. And in order to avoid that stress, you just leave it till maybe you very much need it. Makes sense to me. Yeah, so you mentioned um, that you took some learnings from your current role with Next.js. Maybe, um, I mean, what kind of things are you talking about in terms of the structure of your application? What, what tips did you kind of get from your, your Next.js application at work that you maybe could share with us? And, uh, this okay, is so with my little experience of Next.js, I didn't really know how to work with get server side props, which is the the function for doing server rendering within pages. So I didn't really know how to work with that. And our, regarding folder structure, all I did was have a components folder and maybe a, a views folder where I have all of the pages. I also saw how TypeScript was used before. While using TypeScript before, I only know of, okay, number, string. I didn't really know of interfaces. I didn't really know of um, types. So I also saw how TypeScript was used extensively in the project such that even your intelligence shows you the props of a component and it warns you instantly when you violate any of the types you have declared. So the three main things I learned was how to perform server-side rendering operations with get server-side props and folder structure, knowing how to uh, properly have your components, have your containers, and then have your pages, and then TypeScript. That was where I learned a lot of the TypeScript knowledge that I use today for interfaces, for prop types. Uh, before I used prop types, React prop types, but now I use TypeScript for everything. Cool, awesome. And uh, remind me, it's been a while since I've touched Next.js. The Git server-side props, is that, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what that does. Is that like Git data from your server so that it could be like almost like statically injected? Am I remembering that right? Yes, you're getting, you're getting data from your server and then you can inject that data as props to your page component. Okay, so then when I refresh or when I like request my component, I'll get back like markup that doesn't have to go get the data because the data is already kind of exactly. like embedded in. That's okay. the beauty of Next.js. You get it even before the page shows on the web browser. Okay. Cool. I mean, is there anything else you want to maybe uh, talk about that, that we haven't uh, talked about yet or went over yet? Well, I was hoping I would share more on the Gatsby source plugin. Sure, sure. Okay, so like I said, the Gatsby source plugin allows you to pull content from various sources. It could be locally and it could be from an API. Uh, as long as there's a service providing those contents, you can pull them and then your site creates those static assets based on what you have pulled. So with the source plugin, for example, you're building a website, like the article I wrote was using Hashnode. So say you are building your own blog you want to have your own blog with your own styles, with your own header, with your own navigation. But then you have a lot of articles already on Hashnode and you don't want to rewrite all of them again. So like I showed in the article, you can create your source plugin and you can use Hashnode's API to pull your articles through that API. And when you pull it through that API, you create GraphQL nodes from the data you have pulled. And then after creating GraphQL nodes, uh, let's say in the blog part, in the blog page of your website, you can use GraphQL to pull 
all of those articles you have written and then you can display them on the front end. So you can display that on the front end and then add it to whatever articles you are going to write on your own space. So that's the way it works. The GraphQL API is a, uh, the Gatsby API is a GraphQL API. So you use a GraphQL service or a GraphQL library to query that API and then you get the articles and then you display them on your website. And then the way Gatsby also works is once you add any article to Hashnode, you would have to rebuild your website so that it pulls the fresh data coming from Hashnode. And you can also create a tool, if possible, such that once you write an article and it goes to Hashnode, a build is automatically run on your own website so that it pulls the fresh data. So Hashnode, I, I think it came up in a previous episode as well, but it, I think it's uh, basically like a blogging platform, right? Uh, I'm a curious. Fashion with a very large community. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious. What what is the advantage of writing, say, on Hashnode versus just like having a bunch of markdown files in the same repo as your actual Gatsby site? The reason I don't see any difference. The only difference I see is the stress involved in having to pull every of those articles. Uh, like is and the stress involved in having to write or copy and paste every of those articles in your own space. So instead of going through that, a source plugin would be a very handy tool. You're saying like if you already had things on Hashnode, it's yeah. far easier to pull them than to, I see, like manually create markdown files. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Last time I, I looked at Jamstack or building sites using um, these tools, one thing I saw was that a lot of people were saying uh, having your data, I think, like either WordPress or Hashinode in this, in this instance, or I think other sites like Contentful, I think, and then using um, a tool like Gatsby to actually just pull the data in and basically allow you to keep your content and kind of back end, if you like, in WordPress, but then your front end is in React. And so I'm guessing with um, with Gatsby, that line of thinking is, is being quite um, heavily promoted, I, I imagine, and is being touted as, okay, if you have your stuff like you, like you have in Hashnode, for example, and you go into a, um, a company, for me, I'm thinking more, in my first job for I was, I was a developer, I, I was a journalist, and I know that back then we would write our stories in like a CMS system, but then because we had no kind of control in terms of how the front end looked, and because the tools then were quite kind of archaic and quite old, we couldn't maybe take advantage of the newer things that you're allowed with like React, Angular, NetView, whatever. So I'm guessing with a Gatsby tool, if I had a, a blog or a complete website in WordPress, for example, I could use Gatsby to basically pull that data out of WordPress and then using um, Gatsby, be able to make it, maybe use the tools that Gatsby have that maybe I might have an old system. Yes, but that will also depend on how much information WordPress releases. Oh, okay. So WordPress may only release text through their API. They may release images. So depending on the types of data that they release, that would determine what you can pull and use on your own platform. Yeah, and I think it's pretty it's a pretty commonplace thing to have content not in markdown files because we on this call are all developers and like tossing markdown files and like a GitHub repo is like seems like no big deal. But uh, Carl, you mentioned like journalism, like most places that write content, the, the these the people that write it or review it or edit it don't want to manually update markdown files or like they have tools for for writing, for for editing, for processing, mm -hmm. for proofreading, all yes. these types of things, they have these platforms for this. So, I like the this. This is like an appealing workflow to me because then the developers that are working on the site can just use your plugin or use whatever Gatsby workflow to just pull it in from those other platforms that are probably more familiar or more suited to a whole swath of people that aren't uh, like the React developer persona. Another benefit when you look at CMS is with CMS, you can manage drafts. You can oh, yeah. also, yeah. if possible, add reviews or maybe add comments. You can invite someone to also look at something. But if you are doing everything as a markdown, the only way you can manage drafts is 
if you haven't pushed the master yet, because once you push the matter, <laughs> it appears on your website. So I think that's the benefit of CMS is handling your your every of those assets somewhere else and then just pulling them into your own application. Yeah, I mean, as long as you're probably more than one person working on a site or working writing articles, you're probably going to want some sort of a headless CMS like WordPress content or yeah, WordPress contentful sanity. There's it seems like there's a new one every day. But personally, yeah. I'm one of those developers who wants complete control over my content because most of my content right now is on Medium, to be completely honest. And I've realized that while that's great for generating you know, new readership and reaching people, if Medium went down tomorrow, I would be completely out of luck for all the hours and words that I have put on that website. So... I'm actually in the process of taking all of my Medium articles very slowly and making them into markdown files that I have complete control over. So now if GitHub goes down, then I'm out of luck, but then pretty much the rest of the internet will be out of luck with me. So <laughs> we'll all be starting over from scratch at that point. But yeah, <laughs> yeah it, that's the I guess the biggest drawback is that you're depending on somebody, some source outside of yourself for holding on to that valuable content that you've made. So Paige, what you need to do is you need to write a Gatsby plugin <laughs> that scrapes medium, right? And turns it into markdown files. It's clearly, right? That, that sounds not that bad. <laughs> I mean, there it could be. That also sounds like it would take me probably twice what? or four times the time than just <laughs> copy pasting it. Be? I believe there should be a Gatsby source plugin for Medium already. There probably (laughs) is. Look for it. There is. Yeah, I mean, I should just save Paige like hours and hours of her life. (laughs) Potentially. (laughs) Right now, for my blog, which has been neglected heavily, sadly, and needs a lot of love, and I've I've been inspired by Paige's efforts actually to make her make her blog look much much nicer. (laughs) I'm using Hugo at the moment. Which is obviously um, the the one built. I think I think it's built using Go, if I'm correct. And yeah, so, and I've been thinking about I need to change it and also shift my content from Dev to TL uh, at the moment, which is where I'm when I do blog. I write on there, but I also want to have my own space on the internet. And initially, I was quite skeptical of Gatsby because I felt like it just was adding a lot of more adding a lot of, of complexity. But I think having spoken to you, um, Dylan, and also seeing Paige's work, I think I might give it a go now actually and uh, and see where it takes me. And hopefully I'm able to come back maybe in a few months time and say, yeah, it's worked. I've done it. <laughs> so <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, Carl, I've been working on this blog since April of last year on nights and weekends and when I had free time. So it took me <laughs> quite a while until I felt confident enough with it, you know, looking decent, functioning on mobile and yeah. desktop to where I finally pushed it live into production, which was the beginning of March. So yeah, don't feel bad at all. This has been yeah. a long time getting to this point where it looks pretty good. So it might be a few more months. <laughs> <laughs> the thing with personal websites is you're never just satisfied. No. You want to have a bookmark feature. You want to have dark mode. And until you do all of these, you don't want to publish it yet. <laughs> And then you see something cool on someone else's site and you're like, oh, I should have that too. Yeah. (laughs) How did they do that? That is funny. Like I'm jealous, somehow jealous of everybody else's personal website, but I I always think my own is trash, right? (laughs) Like. Like Gillian, I noticed you you have on your site, your like about page, you have just a fun little animation on your profile picture which I saw that I was like, oh, that's super cool. I should totally <laughs> do that or steal that. Or I, I should have cool ideas like that. <laughs> awesome. This episode is sponsored by Sentry. Sentry is the thing that I put into all of my apps first thing. I figure out how to deploy them. I get them up on the web and then I run Sentry on them. And the reason why is because I need to know what's going on in my app all the time. The other thing is, is that sometimes I miss stuff. I'll run things in development, works on my machine. We've all been there, right? And then it gets up into the cloud or up on a server and stuff happens, stuff breaks. 
I didn't configure it right. AWS credentials, something like that, right? And so I need to get the error reporting back. But the other thing is, and this is something that my users typically don't give me information on, is I need to know if it's performing well, right? I need to know if it's slowing down because I don't want them getting lost into the Twitterverse because my app isn't fast enough. So I put Sentry in, I get all of the information about what's going right and what's going wrong, and then I can go in and I can fix the issues right away. So if you have an app that's running slow, you have an app that's having errors, you have an app that you're just getting started with, go check it out at sentry.io slash four, that's F-O-R, sentry.io slash four slash react, and use the code react roundup, that's all one word, to get three months of their base team plan. So I think we can probably shift into the pick section now. And just for, uh, it's basically a section where we just choose uh, either something we've seen online, maybe an article, or maybe you bought something cool that you want to share with them, everyone else. So um, maybe Paige can start off us with the picks this, this week. Absolutely. So my pick for this week is for everyone who has batteries that power vehicles. It could be a car battery, maybe a boat motorcycle, anything like that. And it's actually a battery charger slash uh, conditioner. So if you've ever noticed, sometimes if you haven't started something up for a while, it'll have a hard start. That's usually because the battery has built up some acid in it that's making it difficult to start, or it just needs really to be put through its paces. And there's a product called Optimate, which does high-performance battery chargers. And because my husband has a company with equipment, he's quite familiar with these. But this is a great little tool, and you can attach it to any type of battery, car battery, like I said, a lawnmower, really anything that has kind of a, a typical battery setup. And this little attachment will run the battery through its paces and basically break up any acid that it might have that's making it start hard. It will just kind of bring it back to almost like new condition as if it was a brand new battery. And it's, you know, depending on which one you get, it can range anywhere from about 40 bucks to you can get ones that can do all sorts of different sizes of batteries, 12 volt, 24 volts and larger. Um, for commercial use for, you know, a few, a couple hundred dollars. But it's been really great for extending the life of my own car's batteries and for some of the equipment that he has but hasn't turned on for a while. So if you ever need something like that, I would definitely recommend checking out these Optimate chargers because they're they're pretty legit. Yeah, we have that problem too with lawn equipment because our lawn stuff only you only need it for like five, six months out of the year here. So when we start it back up, it's constantly an issue. Like who knows what the battery is going to do. So yeah, that's that's exactly what this kind of stuff is built for. I mean, they work really well. Ooh, awesome. Let's go to TJ. I'm going to pick a framework called Remotion. It's this, it, I just saw it a couple of weeks ago and it's basically a framework that lets you build programmatic videos in React. So uh, probably the best example I can think of is like, if you're a Spotify user, you might know that they, they give you like this little visualization of the songs you listened to in the last year. But so it's like a, a video file, but like it's unique to the, the person. So the, the framework is for building videos with React, but it's not like a video editor. So it's not like an iMovie sort of thing. It's, it's basically like you're creating a set of animations and at the end, the tool turns it into an MP4 video file. So it's it's kind of cool because you're making videos, but you can use like React. So you can like dynamically bring in data for driving this video, which is something like would you'd never do in something like iMovie or something like that. So I'm going to link to the framework and I'm also going to link to a chat I did with the, the guy behind it because it, it's one of those things that like it sounded cool, but it didn't click for me. And then when I saw him actually like use the thing, it sort of blew my mind a little bit. So. I, I'll recommend that and I'll toss it in the, the show notes. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the website. It sounds quite cool, actually. Turn that into videos. Definitely check it out. Awesome. And yeah, my picks for today. Uh, the first one is there's a newsletter, which is Jamstack. And it basically gives you the latest news in the kind of Jamstack ecosystem. So um, it has articles on how to do things in Gatsby. It has stuff about Next.js. Uh, basically, all the kind of um, Jamstack key 
um, kind of desk issues, right? So it's quite cool if you want to be if you want to be up to date with, with the latest news in terms of that world. And the second and more fun pick is barbecues. So over here in the UK, we have been allowed to actually meet outside um, because we've been in lockdown since December last year. And only, I think, two weeks ago, they actually allowed us to meet outside in, in um, up to six people at a time. And I had a barbecue this weekend um, just to finally celebrate being able to come out in the open and have some more social life in this um, in these kind of strange times we're, we're in. And I've got a link to a video that has on YouTube about basically how to have barbecues in terms of how to clean your, your barbecue grill, because that's the one thing I, I really hate is cleaning afterwards yeah. and, and i've been basically trying all kind of techniques using baking soda vinegar soaking it in water soaking it and putting it in like in like newspapers cleaning your grill with um, an onion or before you even start doing a barbecue using potatoes to actually make the grill not stick to the meat so basically yeah if you're if you're looking forward to having barbecues this summer um that video could help you on your way so that's for that that's me let's go to dylan what picks have you got for us this week Okay, I didn't prepare for this, but <laughs> recently, that was Monday, I, I looked into Cypress UI testing framework. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I've heard a lot of people say it's used for end-to-end testing, but the reason why I haven't used it before was I didn't really know what to test. So in where I work, we're working on a, I made some changes and then I had to write some tests for those changes. And in the process of writing those tests, I realized or I discovered few things that I could also test for on my own website. So I picked up Cypress on Monday and I love the development experience of Cypress. It's with it presents to you a Chrome instance. And on that Chrome instance you can literally see each and every process or each and every step of the test that fails or that passes. You can also take snapshots of when this particular test passed and this particular test failed. So if there's anyone who haven't tried it yet and you're looking to get into UI testing, uh, UI testing, then you should check out Cypress. Oh, I think we actually had an episode, was it two or three weeks ago or so, where we actually spoke to a developer who actually about testing in depth as well and i think we touched upon cypress um i think selenium and other different tools as well so yeah, yeah. i'm a huge fan of cypress my team uses it it's so easy to get started with i that's a great pick yeah awesome so um if anyone wants to get in touch with you delian either online or through twitter i mean is that what's your what's your hand on twitter and what's your website where people can can kind of get in touch say hi ask questions I think I can share it in the chat section. So that's Twitter and... Cool. And we'll put those in my notes as well for anybody else who wants to have a look at it. Yeah, I think those are the two relevant ones, most relevant. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dylan. Really appreciate it. And thank you for helping me see that Gatsby actually is, is an option now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was a bit on the, on the, on the edge and then um, Paige pushed me a bit, but now you've, you've completely <laughs> pushed me over, so I'll be, I'll be having a look at that. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It was nice sharing all of this. Cool. And thank you, everyone else, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you. All right. Bye. See you later. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.